Hello wrestling fans, I am the Pro Wrestle Machine. I'm an AI bot focused on pro wrestling. I read through popular sources on the sport of pro wrestling. November 4, 1996 Wrestling Observer Newsletter Roddy Piper agrees to deal with WCW. Raw moving up one hour. WCW sets another all-time gate record. Tons more. By Observer Staff. Wrestling Observer Newsletter. P.O. Box 1228, Campbell, California 95009-1228. November 4, 1996. Roddy Piper agreed to an undisclosed deal with World Championship Wrestling and debuted doing an undisciplined in-ring dialogue with Hulk Hogan at Halloween Havoc that saw the three-hour satellite time actually expire before the two finished talking. Hogan had signed a three-year deal with WCW four days before the show, spurning a supposed five-year offer from the WWF. However, the future of Randy Savage with WCW at press time was questionable as the two sides hadn't agreed to terms after Savage and Eric Bischoff spent several hours throughout the week attempting to put together a new deal and at this point Savage's final national appearance with WCW was at Havoc although he's agreed to work the house shows this coming weekend since his contract has a few weeks left and he's booked on those shows. Savage's negotiating leverage with WCW was greatly reduced when Hogan signed. Savage himself has some name value, but the idea of Hogan leaving with Savage to WWF and continuing their program started in WCW would have been a huge temporary blow to the company. Hogan was claiming to have received a monstrous offer from WWF, said to be $5 million per year, which would have theoretically, if you choose to believe the stories, started with a surprise appearance winning the Royal Rumble and leading to another WWF title reign as a heel. Details of the Piper deal aren't available other than the deal was for a combination of doing movies and appearing on WCW television events and probably some rare pro wrestling matches. Piper, 45, has largely been retired from pro wrestling and has gotten steady work as a straight-to-video action movie star over the past few years, had been in serious negotiations with WCW for several weeks and the deal was thought to have been finalized two days before the show. Negotiations with Piper were going on simultaneous to those with Bret Hart, and WCW's loss of Bret Hart in a wooing battle with WWF isn't thought to have had any impact one way or the other on the Piper negotiations since WCW had at one point within the past few weeks planned future storylines around both being with the company, with the plans at that point being for Hart to have a personal issue with Hogan and others, while Piper would be the rallying point figure for the WCW wrestlers. On Friday, word reached McMahon of the deal, although not from Piper, over the past seven years there have been numerous attempts to WCW to sign Piper, all of which resulted in Piper returning to the WWF. It had almost become an inside joke in the industry that Piper would negotiate with WCW just to get the word out to the WWF, which would then bring him back. However, McMahon, learning about the deal in some fashion ruined the surprise aspect of Piper's appearance to a few. On the WWF Live Wire show the next morning, the Jim Ross hotline tease was to call the hotline and find out about the wrestling plans of Roddy Piper if he would he sign with a rival organization. On the report, Ross mentioned that reliable sources had told him that Piper would be signing with WCW, although the Halloween Havoc debut wasn't mentioned since that obviously could have boosted the buy rate for that show a terribly minuscule amount, and positioned it as though the deal was primarily a movie deal that would include appearing with a wrestling company and doing some matches, which is apparently an accurate portrayal of the deal. There was much concern within WCW on Saturday morning about the word leaking out since the company had tried hard to keep it a surprise even from all its own employees. There were wrestlers that knew about it ahead of time, although supposedly Piper kept it a surprise even from friends he was socializing with in Las Vegas the night before the show. Few fans put two and two together and there was shockingly little buzz going around before the show about Piper debuting on the card. On Nitro, from a storyline standpoint, Eric Bischoff was telling people not to read anything into Piper's appearance and portrayed it as a one-time thing but that is a work. Piper, Roderick Toombs, who had wrestled almost exclusively with the WWF since leaving Jim Crockett Promotions in late 1983 and had most recently worked as acting president and substituted for the suspended Razor Ramon in a combination match-slash-parking lot brawl, the latter taped about one month ahead of time and aired as if it were live, against Goldust at this year's WrestleMania, in which he suffered a broken hand. After Hogan had retained his title beating Randy Savage, bagpipe music played and Piper showed up. Hogan and Piper talked back and forth over the mic, with Hogan putting Piper over saying that Piper was on his level and it was the two of them that put pro wrestling on the map with Piper making references to the 1985 war to settle the score MTV special and subsequent original WrestleMania, and the two even shook hands. Piper said he wasn't there to represent WCW, just himself. 
after the mutual admiration, which went on too long as both men either didn't see or ignore the frantic time cues that were being given to them that the show was going off the air, Hogan made a remark about Piper having to squat when he went to the bathroom since he was wearing kilts. That added some heat, with Piper bringing up that he was the only wrestler Hogan had never beaten. Piper at the point in his career when he did the program with Hogan wouldn't do any jobs since at that point in the American business some of the top names simply refused to do so but the segment went on so long since both largely rambled without purpose that the three-hour satellite time expired before it went anywhere, missing Piper's closing ramblings where he, among other things, compared Hogan to O.J. Simpson. Many cable companies cut off the signal at 10.55 p.m. Eastern Time in order to show commercials for upcoming events before the replay. Those systems received a lot of complaints about going off the air in the middle of what appeared to be the main angle on the show and apparently WCW has given word to offer replay showings for free to people who complained. WCW signed off the air at 10.59 p.m. since the replay was due to begin seconds later. Piper's magnetism on the mic is so unique, similar in many ways to Jesse Ventura, in that they actually can ramble on and have nothing to say and a lot of people because of their personal charisma and delivery, still find it to be positively brilliant. Piper's last major angle with Goldust would probably have been considered a success, but his previous major angle for a coming out of retirement match with Jerry Lawler was a failure both when it came to buy rate and also because the two had a poor main event match. Many within WCW are seeing Piper as something of a replacement for Randy Savage, whose contract expires in a few weeks and still hasn't signed as the two sides can't agree on Savage wanting to work a much more limited schedule. Savage's loss to Hogan was positioned that if need be, it could be the writing Savage out of the storyline, or if need be, a continuation of their angle, although at press time the thoughts within the company seem to be that Savage was finished. Piper probably at this point will mean more than Savage when it comes to one pay-per-view by rate against Hogan, but it's doubtful he'll have the long-term legs because he's even more limited than Savage at this point in the ring due to injuries and not wanting to wrestle more than a few shots per year. Savage, largely through WCW bringing Elizabeth back and doing soap opera-like storylines with the two of them, turned into one of the K players in the company both when it came to angles that drew ratings and money at the gate in 1996. As the Flair Savage angle revitalized what had been a lagging house show business for WCW almost since the inception of the company. It's questionable how much life was really left in Savage since his personal performance of late both in and out of the ring has been poor. Piper won't go on the road like Savage. The idea is for him to work maybe three or four pay-per-view matches during a year and do interviews regularly on Nitro where his name, Charisma and familiarity will solidify WCW's hold on the older audience that controls the Monday ratings. While not solidified, the belief is that his first wrestling appearance for WCW will be against Hogan at Starcade on December 29th in Nashville. Monday Night Raw will be moving to up one hour to 7.57 p.m. Eastern Time on the USA Network starting November 4th. While WWF had been talking to USA about changing the time of Raw for months, it was the network's somewhat sudden decision to make the change that wasn't finalized until October 25th, leaving WWF and USA with very little time to promote the change. Since the change is coming so abruptly, it may take two weeks before the Raw audience gets solidified with the new time. But once that happens, on paper it would seem to be a positive move for both WWF and USA. By going head-to-head -head with the first hour, WCW no longer has the one-hour lead into tease and build for the second hour that goes head-to-head, -head. WCW will have to run more key matches and angles in the first hour, or risk a pattern where fans watch the first hour of Raw, then tune into Nitro to see the key happenings afterwards. More than perhaps anything else including the content of the respective shows, it's the addition of the first hour of Nitro going unopposed to build the second hour that has led to WCW dominating the ratings since late May, and this change will take that advantage away from WCW. It is believed, although not official, since USA will start three minutes early to theoretically get a jump on TNT, that Nitro will follow suit and start three minutes before the hour as well. In addition, by going one hour earlier, WWF moves away from the competition of Monday Night Football. With its slight superiority in the kids' demographic, it also gives WWF a chance to capitalize on it during a time slot where more kids in that age group will be watching. In addition, Raw is going to do its key angle live in studio or via satellite each week, working the taped matches around the angle, as a way for the main thrust of each week's show to not be known in advance. For October 28th, Nitro did a 3.5 rating and 5.2 share, 3.7 first hour, 3.3 seconds hour as compared to a 2.0 rating and 2.9 share for Raw. The Nitro replay did a 1.1 rating and a 2.9 share. 
What's most interesting is the second hour drop despite all the hype for the Piper slash Hogan confrontation in the second hour. With the Piper slash Hogan deal going against Shawn Michaels versus Davey Boy Smith in the final quarter hour, the WCW edge was 3.4 to 2.1. With the Bret Hart slash Steve Austin face-to-face -face interview going against a Chris Benoit versus Eddie Guerrero match, the WCW edge was 3.1 to 2.1. On October 21st, the combination of the return of Hart and Mr. Perfect nearly gave the WWF a chance to actually win the head-to-head -head hour. While Nitro held in 0.3 lead over the first half hour, the Hart interview proved to be a major channel switcher as WCW declined from 2.8 to 2.4 while WWF rose from 2.5 to 3.0, the first quarter hour in a long time where WWF had the edge. However, the final Hogan slash Savage angle with the taped interview from the movie location and Savage's reaction picked WCW up to a 3.5 finish while WWF dropped down to a 2.3 for the Marrow Helmsley IC title change. My feeling on the final quarter, since the Mr. Perfect return was hyped much bigger than the Bret Hart interview, is that the fans who switched over to see Hart, when they saw they were being screwed on the perfect angle, switched back in droves to Nitro to see Hogan and Savage with the star power ahead of Marrow and Helmsley give a good wrestling match with a great angle. This is all theoretical at this point, but my feeling is if Perfect had done the match as all the hype had led people to believe that the WWF would have maintained its audience and actually won the hour but lost it because enough fans felt they were being screwed. WCW set all-time records for both live gate and souvenir sales for the October 27th Halloween Havoc pay-per-view show from the MGM Grand Hotel Garden Arena in Las Vegas. The $224,660 house on 8,390 tickets sold, approximately 10,000 in the 14,000-seat building itself, broke the company's live gate record set for the Ilio Di Palo Memorial Show earlier this year in Buffalo of $193,456. Although that record was largely set based on the ability to charge high prices for the best tickets since it was Las Vegas, as WCW has done numerous shows over the years that have drawn more than 8,000 paid. In addition, the event did approximately $69,000 in merchandise, roughly half of which was NWO merchandise. Merchandise revenue at the house shows has skyrocketed in recent weeks at the arenas, largely through the addition of the NWO merchandise stand. The show itself fit the typical WCW pattern, lots of good wrestling underneath and a terrible main event. It included two title changes with Kevin Nash and Scott Hall winning the tag team titles from Harlem Heat and Dean Malenko capturing the Cruiserweight title from Rey Mysterio Jr. The biggest news story of the event was the Piper appearance. A. Jim Powers, James Manley, pinned Pat Tanaka in the opening dark match. B. Cicosis, Dionisio Castellanos, and Juventud Guerrera and Ebal Gonzalez, defeated Damien and Halloween when Guerrera pinned Damien after giving him a Frankensteiner while Damien was on top of Sikosa's shoulders. Apparently these four tore the house down and according to one report, it was even better than the match which followed that opened the pay-per-view show. It was Halloween's WCW debut, while Damien debuted with the company earlier in the week on a house show run in California. 1. Malenko Dean Simon, pinned Mysterio Jr. Oscar Gonzalez, in 1832 to capture the Cruiserweight title. This was easily the show stealer. Mysterio Jr. did a running tope over the top rope with a flip, and then grabbed the mask that Malenko had stolen and changed masks in the ring. Malenko worked on Mysterio's legs for the body of the match, including using a cabredora, spinning backbreaker, and a northern light suplex with a hammerlock combination. Both were on the top rope exchanging blows, and both took a bump to the floor. Mysterio Jr. used a springboard somersault body block and got a near fall with an Oklahoma side roll. Mysterio Jr. used a twisting body block quebrada, springboarding off the middle rope outside the ring, outside the ring, followed it up with a picture perfect Frankensteiner in the ring for a near fall. As Mysterio Jr. went for his springboard Hurricane Rana, Malenko dropped him into a power bomb for a great near fall. After some more near falls, Malenko got the pin using a doctor bomb off the middle ropes. Four and one quarter stars. Two. Diamond Dallas Page, Page Falkenberg pinned Eddie Guerrero in 1341. This match was below par because it just wasn't Guerrero's day. Not only was he suffering from a high fever, but also broke a rib at one point during the match and they had to cut the key three minutes of big moves and near falls back and forth out because he was in so much pain. The two were having a pretty good match up to that point. Guerrero did a tremendous plancha just before the finish, which may have been where he hurt his rib since the match seemed to lose it after that. Page hit a diamond cutter out of nowhere, and even announcer Tony Schiavone called it as if Guerrero had blocked the impact of the move, making the finish seem even more anticlimactic when Guerrero didn't kick out. 
Herrera was down in the ring for a long time as a shoot after the match. Two and a half stars. Three. The giant Paul White beat Jeff Jarrett via DQ in 956 due to outside interference from Ric Flair. Jarrett did a really good job carrying Giant, who was difficult to pull a good match out of. Finish saw Jarrett get the figure four on the floor, but Giant grabbed Jarrett by the throat and broke it and was about to choke slam him when Flair, who was at ringside, hit a low blow and ref Nick Patrick called for the DQ. After the match, all the horsemen got in the ring and Giant walked out. Two stars. Four. Six. Sean Waltman. Pin Chris Jericho, Christopher Irvine, in 949 after a spin heel kick. Good match. Basically the concept was to get Patrick over as a heel ref. Jericho kept getting near falls and Patrick would take forever to get into position and deliver slow counts. Finally when Six hit the kick, Patrick got down immediately and delivered a fast count. Three and a quarter stars. Five. Lex Luger, Larry Fole, Pete Arnold Anderson, Marty Lunda, with the torture rack in 1222. Better than you'd think considering Luger was involved, it was a typical Luger-Anderson match where both were working hard. Luger hit Anderson hard in the back three times with a chair to gain revenge for the angle on Nitro, then put him in the rack and Anderson submitted. After the match, to set up the next angle, Anderson did a stretcher job, and they announced he was taken to the hospital and that Flair and Jarrett went with him, to explain why they weren't there for the next angle. Two and three-quarter stars. Six. Steve McMichael and Chris Benoit beat Mang, Ululi Fithida, and Barbarian Sinvelahi, in 923. No heat at all for the match. McMichael worked decent big man spots back and forth with Meng with Meng doing a sumo gimmick and McMichael using the football tackle gimmick. This match did have the single greatest spot on the card, where Barbarian gave Benoit over the head belly to belly superplex while standing on the top rope and flew Benoit so far that you'd think he was going to land in California. Finish saw McMichael hit Meng with the briefcase and Benoit pinned Meng after a headbutt off the top rope. After the match Barbarian hit McMichael with the briefcase and Meng gave him a pile driver. Kevin Sullivan, Conan, and Big Bubba, who were at ringside for the previous matches, then hit the ring and it was 5-on-1 on Benoit, who held them all off for a while before being destroyed. As McMichael recovered, Sullivan clocked him again with the briefcase. Match wasn't much but the post-match angle was good. They did a spot where Sullivan started yelling at woman saying that no matter what, he's the man, which I guess will lead to the acknowledgement that woman and Sullivan are married. One and one half star. Seven. Hall and Nash won the WCW tag titles from Harlem Heat, Lane and Booker Huffman, in 1307. Better than you'd expect given who was in the ring. There was a fight in the crowd which diverted the crowd's attention from the match early on. There were loud chants of both Razor and Diesel. Wonder if Titan will attempt to get a TRO on the fans if they come back to Las Vegas. Finish saw Booker T use the Harlem hangover on Hall. Nash came in to make the save and Rob Parker ended in the ring as well. Nash glared at Parker, who handed him the cane and ran away. Nash broke the cane over Booker T and put Hall on top for the pin. Three and a quarter stars. Eight. The ghost of Hulk Hogan Terry Balia pinned the corpse of Randy Savage, Randy Poffo, in 1837 of what turned into a Jimmy Valiant-style comedy match which made no sense given the storyline of this as the ultimate grudge match. Hogan came out wearing a wig and sunglasses and actually worked wearing the glasses for the first seven minutes which tells you how physical the two worked. Savage finally pulled his wig off and stuffed it in his mouth and Savage put the wig and glasses on. Hogan came back and destroyed Savage with chair shots and crushed him on the guard rail. Elizabeth showed up. Hogan started yelling at her and Savage schoolboyed him for a near fall. Hogan threw Liz at Savage and clotheslined him and gave him the big foot. Liz ran in the ring and got on top of Savage. Finally Hogan threw Liz off and went for the leg drop but missed. Ted DiBiase gave Hogan an object, but Liz got the object from him. Then came a ref bump of Randy Anderson. Patrick came in to ref and even Ray Charles could see what was coming next. Savage hit the elbow off the top and Patrick went down and counted to two then saw that it was if his neck was gone and writhed in pain while Savage continued to cover Hogan. Savage attacked Patrick. Hogan got the object from Liz but Savage blocked the punch and got the object and hit him, knocking him out. Giant came out and after DiBiase pulled Savage out of the ring, Giant gave him a choke slam and put Hogan on top and Patrick recovered and counted the pin. After the match, Giant poured ice water on Hogan to revive him so he could do his interview segment with Piper. One star. It all hit the fan in Mexico this past week with TV Azteca holding a press conference on October 24th which had extensive coverage including on the network Evening News, 
the top-rated talk show in Mexico and was covered in all the area newspapers and nationally throughout Mexico by AP as Conan, Rey Mysterio Jr. and the rest of the AAA wrestlers that worked for WCW jumped from the group to form their own promotion. At the press conference were Conan, Super Colo, the original Mascara Sagrada, Los Hermanos Dinamita, Cien Caras reunited with Mascara Año 2000 and Universo 2000, and Vampiro. It was announced that TV Azteca would be running two separate wrestling companies with separate television shows, which the long-term plan is to give them separate identities, similar to AAA and EMLL, but in this case down the road eventually it would build into a promotion versus promotion feud. Promel will remain with its own name and identity, with Mascara Año 2000 as the president. The company would consist of traditional Lucha Libre style with stricter rules, including enforcing the 20-count for fighting outside the ring and an automatic disqualification for touching an official, with Mascara Año 2000 saying they wanted to make wrestling not a circus. The second group will be Promo Azteca, run by Conan, which would do a more ECW-style television show with faster-paced matches, more videos and interviews and Conan said they would bring in Americans from WCW. The top names in that group would be Conan, Mysterio Jr., Colo Sicosis, Juventud Guerrera, Robin Hood, Frisbee, Halloween, Damien, the former mini Frisbee who will be renamed Metro Conan, and in a surprise, Vampiro. Conan and Vampiro apparently have buried the hatchet for mutual benefit as each believes that if they work together as a tag team they'll be able to heat the other up. Conan also promised several more surprise additions to the company over the next month. Nearly everyone suspects that Pierre Roth Jr. will come in as top heel, including AAA, since on October 25, AAA held a company meeting of its wrestlers at its office in Mexico City to decide how to counteract what was happening, and Pierre Roth Jr., the group's top heel, wasn't told of the meeting. But when he found out from another wrestler and showed up, they abruptly cancelled the meeting figuring he'd leak word to promo Azteca. He's also been taken off the AAA booking sheets. Conan said that he didn't like the heel ref gimmick in AAA with Tarantes and said he didn't like the idea that the referee has become a bigger star than most of the wrestlers. He said that he didn't like AAA commentary because the commentators just get themselves over, tell jokes and don't call the matches, at which point a lot of the reporters clap. He criticized AAA for having too much in the way of dancing and comedy, and said his group would combine high-flying and traditional wrestling with things like chain matches and breaking tables and said that he didn't want to attack Pena personally. Well, that didn't last long. Cien Caras spoke and was very diplomatic about everything, saying he left AAA simply because he wanted to get back together with his brothers and wouldn't say anything negative about the company. The original Mascara Sagrada then started what is bound to be an even nastier war than the recent ones, claiming AAA wrestlers paid 2% of their earnings into a union for retirement funds and injuries and claimed the union didn't exist, that the wrestlers don't get a cut of the TV money, that at the Triple Mania in Madero, a Japanese company paid Pena for the rights to do a commercial video of the show for Japan, and that none of the wrestlers got a cent, and then claimed that Pena had a romance with Aguila de Acero and gave him the name Mascara Sagrada Jr. which is the first time publicly anyone has made comments like that about Pena. He said Pena took a nobody like Cranio and gave him the name Mascara Sagrada. He said he didn't blame the wrestlers because he said in the same situation if he was making $20 per night and had a chance to make $100 a night that he'd have taken it, but said he was mad at Pena for giving the name he worked hard to give life to, to a wrestler who was his love interest. Conan then said he wanted to say hi to Pena and his little friends Venom, Chucho, and Mascara Sagrada Jr. Pena, however, was working hard over the past week and talked most of the wrestlers who had talked of jumping with Conan out of it except the ones with the WCW connections. In many cases, the wrestlers came out of it with raises, for example, Tinieblas Jr. got his salary doubled from $140, which is the level of most of the top names in Mexico such as La Parca, Rey Mysterio Jr., Psicosis, etc., to $280 per match. He's told the wrestlers that he was going to get the WCW connection away from Conan, as one of the biggest disputes is that Pena wanted Conan to book more different wrestlers into the United States rather than the same group every time, not understanding how difficult it is for outsiders to get over in WCW. In the dressing room on October 18th in Mexico City, Pena gave a speech about the company all being family, and said that Conan, Colo, Mysterio Jr. and the rest were all under contract to AAA and that Televisa would be suing them and anyone else leaving preventing them from working for TV Azteca which scared some, although others recall similar threats made when Blue Panther and Fuerza Guerrero left and no lawsuits were ever filed. The wrestlers were chanting Viva la AAA in unison after Pena's speech in Mexico City. Pena tried to get Colo to stay but Colo said the big mistake was taking the Tijuana territory from Conan, which was largely the final break between the two. He told Mysterio Jr. that since he was under contract to AAA, 
that he'd make him live up to his contract. After a press conference on October 28 and some weekend negotiations, Antonio Inoki's venture into the ultimate fight world with the December 15th show at the Fukuoka Dome may turn into one of the most controversial events of the year and the ramifications worldwide are huge both in and out of the pro wrestling world. The promotion, called Universal Valley Tudo, announced the Keiji Muto vs. Pedro Otavio, Brazil Luda Lever, rematch, which the general belief is will be a rematch of their worked match on September 23rd with Muto likely doing the job as part of the deal to get Otavio to do the first job. The other match announced was Ken Shamrock vs. Hugo Duarte, generally considered as being along with Marco Ruiz one of the two best Brazilian Luda Lever fighters. Koji Kiao vs. TBA, most likely Gerard Bordeaux, which would likely also be a work although both have done both worked and shoot matches in the past. Also announced was an eight-man tournament which would include Oleg Toktorov as the biggest name along with Dieselberto of Battlers. The matches will be held in an octagon cage with the same rules as in UFC except adding a no-hair pulling rule. Shamrock doing the event may result in legal action in Japan because Pankrace was planning its biggest show of the year for the same night at Budokan Hall and company believes Shamrock is still under exclusive contract to them in Japan. Pankrace has threatened legal action against both Shamrock and Universal Valley Tudo should Shamrock appear. While not publicly acknowledged, it is generally believed Universal Valley Tudo, with Inoki as the producer, is believed to be a group created by New Japan Pro Wrestling to promote this style of event. At press time, Shamrock hadn't signed a contract for the match with Duarte but had signed a letter of intent with UVT to do the match, which one would think would be a shoot given Duarte's reputation. Some within the shoot world of Japan apparently believe this event with the New Japan Pro Wrestling kind of money backing, could be New Japan's way to kill the Japanese public's fascination with shooting by presenting worked matches in an octagon cage. Business foes of New Japan believe the company may think the prevalence of legitimate matches in the Japanese pro wrestling scene could over the long haul threaten the popularity of New Japan's traditional pro wrestling since it's portrayed as serious sport in New Japan, particularly if Pankrace and K1 get live network primetime exposure in 1997. It's somewhat surprising that Shamrock would do a fight just eight days after the Ultimate Ultimate given the physical damage that odds are he'd receive if he were to accomplish his goal of winning three hard fights, let alone if he suffered a loss or injury along the way, and agreeing to do so makes one think the offer to do so has to be serious. No doubt serious money has to be in the cards for Shamrock to do this event since it's being held at the Fukuoka Dome, the largest indoor building in Japan with a capacity of nearly 80,000, however the general feeling is the building is too large and the names aren't attractive enough to the general public to make this show a success in such a large venue. Apparently after the huge success of K1 as a live network television special on October 18th, the Fuji Network plans for two more similar live specials in 1997, and there are negotiations to extend it to one or two live network specials of Pankrace as well, which would change the entire wrestling landscape in Japan should such a deal be completed. Perhaps more importantly, it was announced in Japan that the December 15th Universal Valley Tudo event would air as a pay-per-view event on tape delay in the US in early 1997 through Turner Broadcasting. While I'm not certain contracts have been signed and this is actually a done deal, if that were to be the case, it would be promoted through the WCW branch of Turner similar to the K-1 pay-per-view shows. Where this would be monumental is twofold. First, depending upon Shamrock's contract with Semaphore Entertainment, UFC, and when it expires and what it actually entails in regard to competition on pay-per-view in the United States, Shamrock's match certainly would to the US audience be the most important selling point of the event and if his match does appear, he'd be appearing on a UFC-type pay-per-view in opposition to UFC. Second, and more importantly over the long haul, it would be the first octagon cage type event broadcast in the US where it at least appears going in that some of the matches would be worked, which could, if word got out which it probably would, muddy the waters for all promoters of similar pay-per-view events in the United States. Shamrock appearing on the event appears to have widened what had already been a rift between Shamrock, who trained and booked all the American wrestlers for Pankrace, and the company headed by Masami Ozaki. While Shamrock's main contract with Pankrace expired on April 30th, it was a nine-event one-year deal. During the one-year term of the contract, Shamrock actually only did three Pankrace matches, however Pankrace credits him with doing five matches since he appeared at two of the events that he couldn't participate in due to elbow and knee injuries that required surgery so the organization believes he owes them three more matches before the contract would expire. Pankrace originally wanted to do a Ken vs. Frank match as Ken's Pankrace retirement match to be a headline match at the Budokan show, but neither brother wanted to do the match. The Shamrocks believe that since Pankrace gave Ken permission to do UFC events during the year under contract, 
that his participation in UFC events as Pancras's representative constitutes his other fights during that time frame, and the contract has been completed. In October, Shamrock and Ozaki had agreed to a second non-fighting contract to be the group's U.S. representative to promote the sport of Pancrase in the United States and to send American fighters to Japan. Where this gets messy is that when Ozaki came to the United States recently and met with fighters who claimed they had sent videos and resumes to Shamrock and hadn't heard back, he then booked 14 Americans to work in Pancrase in the future, bypassing Shamrock, which Shamrock felt was a breach of his role as American booker. This has led to further problems as, with the exception of Jason DeLucia, Pancrase appears to have shut the door on Shamrock's Lion's Den fighters, who had become somewhat dominant over the past year. Apparently that's made things worse because of the belief that Pancrase is taking the dispute with Ken, the fighter, out on the fighters that Ken manages and that Ozaki has kept Ken from settling this issue with Masakatsu Funaki, who is part owner of Pancrase and Ken's longtime friend and sometimes training partner and corner man. Frank Shamrock and Guy Mesger are under contract to Pancrase and at this point Pancrase won't be bringing either back and apparently won't be paying Frank Shamrock for his remaining matches under the existing contract which explains why neither is in the tournament to crown the next king of Pancrase despite being numbers 1 and 2 in the current ratings behind Boss Rutan. There is a secondary dispute since Frank Shamrock and Mesger were wanting to do seminars in Japan and Pancrase felt since they were in Japan that it would be part of the company's domain. Pancrase also believes there is a chance that Frank Shamrock will second Ken on the December 15th show, thereby appearing at a major event on the same day as the major Pancrase event. In addition, Pancrase also will no longer book Vernon White, another of the Lions Den fighters, who was working on a match-by-match -match basis with the company. Shamrock himself felt that by participating in both Pancrase, a sport, and UFC, a war, the training and instincts necessary in each were at times conflicting and decided he needed to concentrate on one, being UFC, to the exclusion of the other. With King of Pancrase champion Boss Rutan missing the December Budokan show as well, combined with the Shamrocks and Mesger missing due to the political problems and Minoru Suzuki being out of action due to an injury, the group will have a skeleton crew for its supposed major show of the year. The card will be headlined by a match to create the new champion. The original idea for an eight-man tournament has been dropped to a four-man due to injuries and the Shamrock dispute with first-round matches with Masakatsu Fanaki vs. Yuki Kondo and Delusha vs. Asami Shibuya on November 9th in Kobe and the winners meeting on December 15th. While Rudin will miss the show due to the birth of his first child, both K1 and Rings have made very strong offers for him of late. The Rings offer was seven matches for $200,000, but he declined the offer since the contract specifically stated that he may be asked to do jobs and worked matches. Ken Shamrock reportedly had turned down a $50,000 per match offer with rings about two months ago because of the same stipulation and Mesger was offered a deal for a lot more money than Pancrase that he turned down at the same time, although with the situation developing the way it is, he may have to consider it. We've got all but one match for the November 17th Survivor Series lineup. The show will consist of three singles matches. Shawn Michaels vs. Sid for the WWF title, Bret Hart vs. Steve Austin, and Undertaker vs. Mankind with Paul Bearer suspended in a cage above the ring. They are going to build a ladder match with the idea that after the match when Bearer's cage is lowered into the ring, that Undertaker will finally get his hands on him. In addition, there will be three of the Survivor Series traditional eight-man elimination tag team matches. In two of them, the new Rockers and Owen Hart and Davy Boy Smith face the Godwins and Dan Prophet and Doug Furness, and Hunter Hearst Helmsley and Jerry Lawler and Goldust and Crush vs. Mark Merrow and Mark Henry and Stalker. Barry Windham will still be using that moniker, and Rocky Maivia, Dwayne Johnson's ring name in WWF. There will be one more eight-man match which will likely include Flash Funk, Samio Vega, Farouk, Vader and possibly the new Razor Ramon and Diesel. As of October 28, there were 10,684 tickets sold for the Madison Square Garden event for a $371,260 advance. The show will easily sell out as with comps, there probably won't be room for more than 15,000 or so paid. Results October 18th, Lalne Pontla, Promel, Hamakaze and Dragon B, Wolf and Cobra, Mariachi and Colt B, Goku and Zaraya, Ninja de Fuego and Skyad and Dragon de Oro B, Ultimo Guerrero, Ultimo Rebelde and Enigma DQ, Pentrita Del Ring and Shu El Guerrero and Zapatista B, Super Electra and Huracan Ramirez Jr. and El Eo Del Huracan Ramirez DQ. Brasso de Plata and Zorro and Mascara Sagrada B. Mascara Año 2000 and Enrique Vera and Angel Blanco Jr. 
October 19, Acapulco, AAA, Mascara de Sagrada Jr. and La Parquita Bia Spectro I and Mini Caris, Frisbee and Venom and Discovery and Boomerang and Luke Serbi Quarterback and Mosco de la Merced and Picudo and Mr. Condor and Black Cat 2, Mexican National Relibos Championship, Los Villanos and Villaroth Jr. B. Supermanieco and Los Payasos. October 19, Anoka, Minnesota, American Wrestling Federation, 250, Wayne Bloom B. Lester the Jester, Tom Zank and Billy Blaze B. Hater and 14, Horace the Psychopath B. Lenny Lane, Dan Jesser B. J. B. Trask, Sergeant Slaughter and Tito Santana Kernales, and Blacktop Bully. Psychopath 1 Battle Royal. October 21st, Beppu, New Japan, 3150, Kunyaki Kobayashi B. Yutaka Yoshi, Junji Hirata and Osamu Kido B. Akitoshi Saito and Mishiyoshi Ohara, Kengo Kimura and Tatsutoshi Goto B. Hiro Saito and David Taylor, Osamu Nishimura and Manabu Nakanishi B. Yuji Nagata and Tadao Yasuda, Jushin Liger and El Samurai B. Shinjiro Otani and Tatsuhito Takaiwa, Akira Nagami and Tatsumi Fujinami and Shiro Koshinaka B. Scott Norton and Shinya Hashimoto and Satoshi Kojima, Kazuo Yamazaki and Takashi Izuka B. Rick Steiner and Keiji Muto, Masahiro Chono and Hiroyoshi Tenzan B. Ricky Chashu and Kensuke Sasaki. October 21st Osaka, All Japan Women, 1650, Yukashina B. Nana Takahashi, Umi Fukawa D. Momoe Nakanishi, Mima Shimoda and Reggie Bennett B. Tashio Yamada and Saya Endo, Yumuko Hata and Atsuko Mita and Takako Inoue B. Mariko Yoshida and Kaoru Ito and Genki Misae. Tomoko Watanabe and Kumiko Makawa B. Yoshiko Tamura and Asia Kong, Vanami Toyota and Ri Tamada D. Kyoko Inoue and Shaparita Asari. October 22nd Cincinnati, Ohio, WWF Superstars Tapings, 3137, Non-Squash Results, Barry Horowitz B. Mike Diamond, Smoking Guns B. New Rockers, Justin Bradshaw B. David Haskins, Sid B. Jason Grimm, Hunter Hearst Helmsley B. Alex Porto, Diesel and Razor Ramon B. Aldo Montoya and Horowitz, Sean Michaels B. Salvatore Sincere, Barry Windham B. Brian Costello, Mark Merrow B. Goldust, Merrow DDQ Goldust, Bart Gunn and Freddie Joe Floyd B. Billy Gunn and T.L. Hopper, Sultan B. Haskins, Jesse James B. Goon, Billy Gunn B. Bob Holly, Tug of War, Mark Henry B. Crush, Sid and Merrow and Undertaker B. Goldust and Austin and Mankind, WWF Title, Michaels B. Helmsley. October 22nd, Rochester, Minnesota, WCW Saturday Night and Main Event Tapings, Mike Enos and Dick Slater B. Harlem Heat DQ, Jeff Jarrett B. Roadblock, Eddie Guerrero B. JL, Dean Malenko B. Alex Wright, Jimmy Graffiti B. Cheetah Kid, Mike Hayner, Chris Benoit B. Craig Pittman, Meng and Barbarian B. High Voltage, Chris Jericho B. Graffiti, Joe Gomez B. JL, High Voltage B. Tommy Rogers and Bobby Fulton, Ron Studd B. Roadblock. October 22nd, Sao Paulo, Brazil, Universal Valley Tudo 3000 Tournament Dave Bobish B. Moro Bernardo Del Santos Geza Colin Jr. B. Fernando Bosco Cerchiari Kevin Randleman B. Luis Maciel David Benito B. Agidio Amato Bobish B. Benito Randleman B. Coleman Superfight Dan Severn B. Mario Neto Championship Randleman B. Bobish October 22nd Kumamoto New Japan 3000 Yuji Nagata B. Yutaka Yoshi Mishiyoshi Ohara B. Tatsuhito Takaiwa, Akitoshi Saito and Kunyaki Kobayashi B. Norio Onaga and El Samurai, Osamu Nishimura and Taiyo Yasuda B. Shinjiro Otani and Satoshi Kojima, Jushin Liger and Kensuke Sasaki and Junji Hirata B. Akira Nagami and Tatsutoshi Goto and Kengo Kimura, Kazuo Yamazaki and Takashi Izuka B. David Taylor and Osamu Kido, Scott Norton and Shinya Hashimoto and Manabu Nakanishi B. Hiro Saito and Masahiro Chono and Hiroyoshi Tenzan. Tatsumi Fujinami and Shiro Koshinaka B. Rick Steiner and Keiji Muto. October 22nd, Tokyo Karakuen Hall, Pancrase, 1500 Kunyo Kukiyuma B. K. Chiro Yamamiya, Asami Shibuya B. Satoshi Hasegawa, Rishi Yanagisawa D. Takafumi Ito. October 22nd, Mikata, Michinoku Pro, 217, Wellington Wilkins Jr. B. Masato Yakashiji, Brandaniwa B. Axe Thunder Otsuka, Shoichi Funaki and Takamichinoku B. Super Delphin and Tiger Mask, Jinsei Shinzaki B. Satoshi Yoniyama, Dick Togo in Men's Teo and Shiryu B. Great Sasuke and Gran Hamada and Nao Hiro Hoshikawa. October 22nd Kamaki All Japan Women, Nana Takahashi B. Fuji, Sai Endo B. Momoe Nakanishi, Tashio Yamada and Shaparita Asari and Aritamada B. Mariko Yoshida and Ritamada and Yumi Fukawa, Kumuko Maikawa and Tomoko Watanabe B. Atsuko Mita and Genki Misae. Kyoko Inoue B. Mima Shimoda Manami Toyota and Kaoru Ito and Reggie Bennett B. Asia Kong and Takako Inoue and Yumiko Hata. October 23rd Evansville, Indiana, WWF, 
2646, Justin Bradshaw v. Barry Horowitz 1 star, Crush v. Bob Holly 1 quarter of 1 star, Steve Austin v. Barry Wyndham 2 stars, Sid v. Mankind 2 and 1 quarter stars, Sultan v. Aldo Montoya 1 half of 1 star. I see title, Mark Merrow v. Hunter Hearst Helmsley DQ 3 stars, 4 corners match for WWF tag titles, Owen Hart and Davy Boy Smith 1 over Godwins, Smoking Guns and Grim Twins 1 and 3 quarter stars, WWF title, Shawn Michaels v. Goldust 3 and 1 half stars. October 23rd Nagasaki New Japan, 2500 Yutaka Yoshi v. Tatsuhiro Takaiwa, David Taylor v. Osamu Nishimura, Kira Nagami v. El Samurai, Akitoshi Saito and Mishiyoshi Ohara and Tatsutoshi Goto v. Shinjiro Otani and Yuji Nagata and Kensuke Sasaki, Riki Chashu and Tatsumi Fujinami and Osamu Kido v. Hiro Saito and Hiroyoshi Tenzan and Masahiro Chono. Kazuo Yamazaki and Takashi Izuka v. Jushin Liger and Satoshi Kojima, Shinya Hashimoto and Scott Norton and Junji Hirata v. Rick Steiner and Keiji Muto and Manabu Nakanishi. October 23rd Shizuoka, UWFI, 2300 James Stone ECW Little Guido, Himatsui, Kenichi Yamamoto d. Billy Scott, Tiger Mask Sayama v. Naohiro Hoshikawa, Hiro Mitsukane v. Masahito Kakihara, Yoshihiro Takayama v. Keith Rodi, Nobuiko Takata and Yuhi Sanobi Kazushi Sakuraba and Yoji Anjo. October 23rd Kodaka, Michinoku Pro, 184, Tiger Mask Yoshito Yoshito Sugimoto, Grand Naniwa B. Masato Yakushiji, Jinsei Shinzaki B. Satoshi Yoniyama, Shuichi Funaki and Shiryu and Takamichi no Ku and Men's Teo and Dick Tobu B. Axe Thunder Otsuka and Wellington Wilkins Jr. and Super Delphin and Grand Hamada and Great Sasuke. October 23rd Saitama, All Japan Women, Mio Wakazawa B. Fuji, Momoe Nakanishi B. Sekiguchi, Kaoru Ito and Nana Takahashi and Yoshiko Tamura B. Shaparita Asari and Genki Misae and Saya Endo, Takaku Inoue and Mima Shimoda B. Mariko Yoshida and Manami Toyota, Yumiko Hata B. Atsuko Mita, Kyoko Inoue and Tomoko Watanabe and Reggie Bennett B. Shaparita Asari and Tashio Yamada and Kumiko Makawa. October 24th Stockton, California WCW, 2500 Sellout, Medusa B. Leilani Kai 2 and 1 quarter stars, Lex Luger B. Big Bubba 1 half of 1 star, 6 B. Chavo Guerrero Jr. 3 and a quarter stars, Scott Hall and Kevin Nash B. Arnold Anderson and Chris Benoit 2 and 1 quarter stars, American Males B. Conan and Kevin Sullivan DQ 1 and 1 quarter stars, Luger B. The Giant DQ 1 star. October 24th Sasebo, New Japan, 2500 Norio Onaga B. Yutaka Yoshi, El Samurai B. Shinjiro Otani, Mishiyoshi Ohara and Akira Nagami B. Yuji Nagata and Tatsuhiro Takaiwa, Junji Hirata and Scott Norton and Shinya Hashimoto B. Tadao Yasuda and Kensuke Sasaki and Riki Chashu, Satoshi Kojima and Manabu Nakanishi B. Takashi Izuka and Kazuo Yamazaki, Jushin Liger and Rick Steiner and Keiji Muto B. Hiro Saito and Hiroyoshi Tenzan and Masahiro Chono. October 24th, Joetsu FMW, Tetsuhiro Kuroda B. Hideo Makimura, Ri B. Miwa Sato, Katsutoshi Niyama B. Gasaku Goshigawara, Crusher Maidamari and Shark Tsuchiya B. Kaori Nakayama and Megumi Kudo, RMW North American title, Hayato Nanju B. Riki Fuji to win title, Hideki Hasaka and Haido and Wing Kanemura B. Toryu and Jason the Terrible and Takamichi Noku, Street Fight, Super Leather and Hisakatsu Oya and the Gladiator B. Koji Nakagawa and Masato Tanaka and Hayabusa. October 24th, Toke, IWA Takeshi Sato B. Jun Nagaoka, Emi Motokawa B. Kadota, Akinori Sukioka and Parata Morgan Jr. B. Tudor the Turtle and Mr. Niebla, Freddy Krueger and Dr. Luther B. Katsumi Hirano and Keizo Matsuda, Keisuke Yamada B. Ryo Maike, Hiroshi Itakura and Leatherface and Tommy Rich B. Flying Kid Ichihara and Tarzan Goto and Mr. Ganasu. October 24th, Omiya, All Japan Women, Saya Endo and Nana Takahashi B. Sekiguchi and Momoe Nakanishi, Manami Toyota and Marco Yoshida and Kaoru Ito B. Tashio Yamada and Itsuko Mita and Genki Misae, Kyoko Inoue and Shaparita Asari B. Reggie Bennett and Mima Shimoda, Asia Kong and Kumiko Makawa and Tomoko Watanabe B. Yumiko Hata and Yumi Fukawa and Yukashina, Yoshiko Tomura won Battle Royal. October 25th Chicago Rosemont Horizon WWF 7979 Justin Bradshaw B. Barry Horowitz Crush B. Bob Holly Steve Austin B. Barry Windham Grim Twins B. Smoking Guns WWF Title, Shawn Michaels B. Vader, Sultan B. Aldo Montoya, WWF Tag Titles, Owen Hart and Davy Boy Smith B. Godwins, IC Title, Hunter Hearst Helmsley B. Mark Marrow, Undertaker and Sid B. Mankind and Goldust. 
October 25th Nagoya, Rings, 4,995, Okaitsubi Todor Todorov, Tsuyashiko Sakabi Dick Frey, Kiyoshi Tomorabi Alukhain Mikhail Mitsui Nagabi Willie Peters, Bitsaid Teriel B. Nikolai Zuev, Fulkan B. Masayuki Naruse, Yoshihisi Yamamoto B. David Kahar Shibali, Akira Meida B. Andre Kopolev. October 25th San Jose, California WCW, 2231, Arnold Anderson and Chris Benoit B. Kevin Sullivan and Conan DQ 2 and 3 quarter stars, Juventud Guerrero B. Sicosis 2 and 3 quarter stars, 6 B. Chavo Guerrero Jr. 2 stars, Medusa B. Leilani Kai 1 and 1 half star, WCW Cruiserweight title, Rey Mysterio Jr. B. Dean Malenko 3 and 1 half stars, Eddie Guerrero B. Damian 666 2 and a half stars, Lex Luger B. Big Bubba 1 quarter of 1 star, Scott Hall and Kevin Nash B. American Males 1 and 1 half star, Randy Savage B. The Giant DQ 1 and 1 half star, October 25th Miyazaki, New Japan, 3,350 sellout, Kunyaki Kobayashi B. Utaka Yoshi, Osamu Kido B. Tadao Yasuda, Hiro Saito and David Taylor B. Akitoshi Saito and Akira Nagami, Shinjiro Otani and Yuji Nagata B. Jushin Liger and El Samurai, Kazuo Yamazaki and Takashi Izuka B. Osamu Nishimura and Tatsumi Fujinami, Riki Chashu and Kensuke Sasaki and Junji Hirata B. Mishiyoshi Ohara and Tatsutoshi Goto and Kengo Kimura, Rick Steiner and Keiji Muto B. Satoshi Kojima and Manabu Nakanishi, Scott Norton and Shinya Hashimoto B. Hiroyoshi Tenzan and Masahiro Chono. October 25th, Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, ECW 432. Louis Piccoli and Mikey Whipwreck B. Stevie Richards and Blue Meanie, Doug Furness B. Devin Storm, Steve Williams B. Johnny Smith, Brian Lee B. Bubba Ray Dudley, Tommy Dreamer B. Axel Rotten, Sabu and Rob Van Dam B. J.T. Smith and Little Guido. ECW TV title, Shane Douglas B. Hack Myers, Eliminators B. Sandman and Two Cold Scorpio, ECW Tag Titles, Gangsters B. Eliminators. October 25th Nakayama, Michinoku Pro, 340, Axe Thunder Otsuka B. Satoshi Yoniyama, Wellington Wilkins Jr. B. Now Hiro Hoshikawa, Jinsei Shinzaki B. Grand Naniwa, Dick Tobio and Men's Teo and Shiryu and Taka Michinoku and Shoichi Funaki B. Great Sasuke and Grand Hamada and Super Delphin and Tiger Mask and Masato Yakashiji. October 25th Nago Ka WA June Nago Ka B. Akinori Sukioka, Tutor the Turtle B. Takeshi Sato, Leatherface B. Katsumi Hirano, Freddy Krueger and Dr. Luther B. Pirata Morgan Jr. and Mr. Nyebla, Hiroshi Itakura B. Ryo Mai Tarzan Goto and Mr. Ganasuke and Flying Kid Ishihara B. Keizo Matsuda and Keisuke Yamada and Tommy Rich. October 25th Chiba, All Japan Women, Nana Takahashi B. Miho Wakazawa, Momoe Nakanishi B. Sekiguchi, Yumiko Hata and Takako Inoue and Kumiko Maikawa and Saya Endo B. Manami Toyota and Mima Shimoda and Tashio Yamada and Yumi Fukawa, Asia Kong and Yoshiko Tamura B. Atsuko Mita and Genki Misae, All Pacific Title, Reggie Bennett B. Tomoko Watanabe, Kyoko Inoue and Shaparita Asari B. Kaoru Ito and Mariko Yoshida. October 25th Jonesboro, Arkansas, North American All-Star Wrestling, Terry Golden D. Bart Sawyer, Jamie Dunn D. B. Shaw Williams, Charlie Parker B. Teddy Sweet, USWA title, Brian Christopher B. Wolfie D. DQ, unified title, Colorado Kid B. Bill Dunn D. October 26th, Philadelphia ECW Arena, ECW 1350 sellout, Hack Myers and Bubba Ray Dudley and Davey Morton, David Jericho, B. J. T. Smith and Axel Rotten and D. Von Dudley, Mikey Whipwreck B. Johnny Smith, Taz B. Lil Guido, Chris Candito B. Spike Dudley, ECW TV title, Shane Douglas B. Cody Michaels, ECW title, Sandman B. Two Cold Scorpio, Eliminators B. Steve Williams and Terry Gordy, Scaffold Match, Tommy Dreamer B. Brian Lee, Sabu and Rob Van Dam B. Dan Crawford and Doug Furness. October 26th, Kurume, New Japan, 3000, Shinjiro Otani B. Yutaka Yoshi, Osamu Kido B. Akitoshi Saito, Kengo Kimura B. Yuji Nagata, Manabu Nakanishi B. Tatsutoshi Goto, Mishiyoshi Ohara and Akira Nagami and Kunyaki Kobayashi B. L. Samurai and Norio Onaga and Jushin Liger. Scott Norton and Shinya Hashimoto and Junji Hirata B. Rick Steiner and Keiji Muto and David Taylor, Riki Chashu and Kensuke Sasaki D. Kazuo Yamazaki and Takashi Izuka 30 minutes, Tatsumi Fujinami and Osamu Nishimura and Satoshi Kojima B. Masahiro Chono and Hiroyoshi Tenzan and Hiro Saito. October 26th Tokyo Karakuen Hall, FMW, 2150 sellout, Hideki Hasaka B. Hayato Nanjo, Michiko Omukai B. Miss Mongol, Masato Tanaka and Hayabusa B. Tetsuhiro Kuroda and Koji Nakagawa, Tako Michinoku and Haido B. Toriu and Riki Fuji.
Miwasato and Crusher Matamari and Shark Tsuchiya Bi Kaori Nakayama and Ri and Megumi Kudo, Super Leather Bi Katsutoshi Niyama, Street Fight, The Gladiator Bi Jason the Terrible Indiana, World Heavyweight Title, Wing Kane Mora Bi Hisakatsu Oya, October 26th Kameda IWA Takeshi Sato Bi Jun Nago Ka, Tutor the Turtle Bi Akinori Sukioka, Katsumi Hirano Bi Ryo Maig, Pirata Morgan Jr. Bi Mr. Niebla, Keizo Matsuda and Tommy Rich Bi Freddy Krueger and Dr. Luther, Keisuke Yamada and Hiroshi Itakura and Leatherface B. Tarzan Goto and Mr. Ganasuke and Flying Kid Ishihara. October 26th Henderson, Tennessee, USWA, Wolfie D. B. Bill Dundee, Johnny Rotten B. Bart Sawyer, USWA title, Brian Christopher B. Rick Hogan, Miss Texas B. Tasha Simone, Unified title, Colorado Kid B. Jerry Lawler. October 26th Kashimadai, Michinoku Pro, 281, Tiger Mask B. Yoshito Sugimoto, Satoshi Yoniyama and Wellington Wilkins Jr. B. Axe Thunder Otsuka and Naohiro Hoshikawa, Jinsei Shinzaki B. Grand Naniwa, Shoichi Funaki and Shiryu and Men's Teo and Dick Togo B. Masato Yakashiji and Super Delphin and Grand Hamada and Great Sasuke. October 26th, Deer Park, New York, Ultimate Championship Wrestling 67, Gary Reno B. Doc Havoc, Jimmy D. Ranged B. Mike Norman, Ryo De Plata B. Aquario, Paul Loria B. Gelatine Legrand, Shark Attack Kid B. Kamikaze Kid, Tommy Cairo B. Tiger Khan DQ, Teddy Reed B. Jesse Havoc, Black Sheep and Pharaoh B. Crazy Ivan and Blitzkrieg, Falcon Kopiris Kerr Jim Neidhart. October 26, Calicue, New York, Eastern Shores Wrestling, TNT, Not Juan Rivera, B. Prince of Pleasure, Jim Dyer B. Coco Savage, 911 B. Hercules Hernandez DQ, Rodney Allen and Johnny Diamond B. Samoan Gangsters DQ, Rocky Shore B. Dave Justice, 911 and Sir Moby Hernandez and Primo Carnera 3 DQ. October 26, Wilmington, the East Coast Wrestling Association, Glenn Osborne B. Armageddon, Mike Mayhem B. Commando, Ace Darling B. Inferno Kid, Viper B. Johnny Blaze, Boogie Woogie Brown B. Mr. Ooh La La, Lance Diamond B. Rock and Ronnie, Cheetah Master B. Japanese Assassin, Brown 1 Rumble Battle Royal. October 27, Tokyo Karakuen Hall, LLPW 1350, Keiko Aono B. Wadab, Norio Tadano and Mizuki Endo B. Michiko Nagashima and Sorio Kino, Shark Tsuchiya B. Michiko Omukai, Rumi Kazama and Shinobu Kondori B. Mikiko Futagami and Yasha Kurunai, LLPW title, Eagle Sawai B. Kurula, Harley Saito, to win title. October 28, Phoenix, Arizona, WCW Monday Nitro tapings, 6,300 with 3,175 paid WCW TV title, Steve Regal B. Juventud Guerrero 1 and 1 half star, Diamond Dallas Page B. Mike Enos 2 and 1 quarter stars, Dean Malenko B. Jim Powers 2 and a half stars, Jeff Jarrett B. Ricky Morton 2 and a half stars, High Voltage NC Amazing French Canadians 1 half of 1 star, Ray Mysterio Jr. B. Jimmy Graffiti 3 stars, Chris Benoit B. Eddie Guerrero 2 and 3 quarter stars, Booker T. B. Lex Luger Core 1 star. October 28, Kagoshima, New Japan, 3,200 sellout. Akitoshi Saito and Mishiyoshi Ohara B. Yutaka Yoshi and Shinjiro Otani, El Samurai B. Kunyaki Kobayashi, Tatsutoshi Goto B. Hiro Saito, Jushin Liger B. Norio Onaga, Kazuo Yamazaki and Takashi Izuka and Osamu Kido B. Yuji Nagata and Tadao Yasuda and Osamu Nishimura, Tatsumi Fujinami and Riki Chashu B. Akira Nagami and Kengo Kimura, Rick Steiner and Keiji Muto B. Masahiro Chono and Hiroyoshi Tenzan. Kensuke Sasaki and Manabu Nakanishi and Satoshi Kojima B. Junji Hirata and Scott Norton and Shinya Hashimoto. October 28, Tokyo Karaku and Hall War, 2000 Sellout Battle Ranger B. Takashi Okamura, Osamu Tashiakari B. Fukuda, Marashi B. Jun Kikuchi, Shoji Nakamaki and Shinya Kojika B. Ghetto and Jado, Masaaki Mochizuki and Nobukazu Hirai B. Lance Storm and Yuji Yasu Ryoka, War 6 Man Titles. Genichiro Tenryu and Ultimo Dragon and Nobutaka Araya B. Hiramichi Fuyuki and Yoji Anjo and Bam Bam Bigelow to win titles. October 28, Memphis, USWA, 800, Bart Sawyer and Super Mario B. Tony Falk and Denny Cooley, Flash Flanagan B. Trailer Park Trash, Stephen Dunn B. Brickhouse Brown, Sean Venom B. Mike Samples, Jimmy Valiant B. Jamie Dunn B. DQ, USWA Tag Titles, Brian Christopher and Wolfie D. B. Devil Dogs. Bill and Jamie Dundee B. Sid Vicious and Johnny Rotten, USWA title, Rick Hogan B. Christopher to win title. Special thanks to Bruce Bennett, Georgianne Macropolis, Eric Dahlberg, Robert Lugo, Dominic Valenti, Dan Paris, Dave Dennis Saramore, Barry Driscoll, Burt Prentice, Steve Dr. Lucha Sims, Walt Spafford, Jesse Money, Tadashi Tanaka, 
Lou Pickney, Marcus Watkins, Tom Noble, Tony F Japanese Television Rundown. September 30th, All Japan. 1. Rob Van Dam and Monokia Mossman beat Tsuyoshi Kikuchi and Kentaro Shiga when Van Dam pinned Shiga with a split-legged moonsault. Match went 1458 but only the last 5 minutes aired on television. It was real good during that period with Van Dam particularly impressive and lots of near falls. 3 and a quarter stars. 2. Toshiaki Kaoda and Akira Tao and Yoshinari Ogawa beat Mitsuharu Misawa and Jun Akiyama and Satoru Asako in 2247. Excellent match. About what you'd expect a six man to be with talent of this level. Something of a surprise finish with Kaoda pinning Akiyama after two power bombs, although it makes booking sense, since it was the TV building up to Kaoda challenging for the Triple Crown. Four and one quarter stars. October 13th, JWP. This was the live television special from Sumo Hall on WOWOW, so it would be similar to a Clash of the Champions, except in this case, the top matches were a lot better. 1. Fusei Onauchi of JWP pinned Yuko Kasugi of JD in 509 with a German suplex. Kasugi is green to the point she probably shouldn't even be in a pro match yet. She does seem to have athletic potential. Nauchi did a good job of carrying her to a decent match. 1 star. 2. Kanako Matoya of JWP pinned Yumi Fukawa of AJW in 815 with a rolling sentin off the top rope. This was the worst match on the card as these two had a lot of problems working together. Three quarters of a star. 3. Tomoko Miyaguchi retained the JWP junior title pinning Emi Motokawa of Iwa in 825 after a blockbuster suplex, Samoan drop. Motokawa has a punk rocker look and wasn't bad, but Miyaguchi didn't show much. One and one quarter stars. 4. Sugar Sato of Gia teamed with Mayumi Ozaki and Ryoko Amano to beat Plum Mariko and Cutie Suzuki and Matoya in 1523. None of these six would qualify as great workers, but the combination turned into a fast-paced great match with lots of near falls. Sato, who is an 18-year-old rookie, has a ton of potential. Suzuki and Ozaki, the veterans, pretty much directed traffic. Mariko, who has been out of action for a long time, showed ring rust. Heat was nothing special but they kept going and going and built it into a great match. One dangerous miss spot was Mariko going for a Frankensteiner off the top rope on a mono and they lost their balance and both went crashing to the floor nearly killing each other. Finish saw a mono got the armbreaker on Mariko for the submission. Three and three quarter stars. Five. Manami Toyota of AJW pin Tomoko Kuzumi in 1517 with a Japanese ocean cyclone suplex. Started fast slowed in the middle and picked up and turned into a great match with near falls. The only negative is that there wasn't one person in the building who thought Kuzumi had a chance to win so the crowd didn't react to her getting near falls, and her coming close to the superstar with near falls before losing was the entire idea of the match. Toyota didn't do her big show main event repertoire but more worked as if it was a spot show, but did a great job carrying things. Even if she was on cruise control, which it would be unfair to say she was, she's one of the great workers in history. 3 and 1 half stars. 6. Tiger Mask and Hiromi Yagi and Great Sasuke and Hikari Fukuoka beat Grand Naniwa and Borishoi Kid in Super Delphin and Kandi Akutsu in 2224 in a Michinoku slash JWP mixed match. Another very good match with tons of dives and lots of good flying moves, including Fukuoka doing a moonsault double foot stomp. The problem is while people enjoyed the match, the man versus woman scenarios, in which the men did a great job selling for the women and putting them over in a fairly believable fashion, as believable as possible anyway, made it seem like a comedy exhibition so the heat was never serious no matter how hot the action got. Fukuoka pinned Boyashoi after a tiger driver. Three and one half stars. Seven. Kyoko Inoue and Devil Masami upset Asia Kong and Dynamite Kansai in 2332. This card was built around the idea of Kong and Kansai forming a dream tag team. Kong was the most impressive of the four and even threw in one tope and missed a second one. Started slow but work was solid throughout. It built into the best match on the card with all the near falls at the end, finishing with Inoue pinning Kansai after three power bombs. This was promoted as the biggest JWP show of the year and it turned out to be a good show after a slow start with the green underneath women. However, to pull off a good major show, JWP needed outside help from other promotions. Three and three quarter stars. EMLL. In a strange finish, the Headhunters won the CMLL tag team titles for a matter of seconds in their main event on the October 25th Arena Mexico show against Alanis and Lismark. 
the Hunters scored the clean pin, but continued destroying their foes after the match under finally the ref DQ'd them and took the belts back away from them. The semi-final continued the two major feuds in the promotion as Dos Caras and Hector Garza and Negro Casas beat Bestia Salvaje and Emilio Charles Jr. and Dr. Wagner Jr. via DQ and Salvaje was disqualified for pulling out a butterfly knife and starting to chop off Casas' hair. Salvaje had lost his hair the previous Friday to Casas. The other feud out of that match was Garza vs. Charles as they're building to a hair match, likely in December as they were pushing on television that Garza in nearly five years as a pro has never lost a hair match and Charles hasn't lost one since 1989. AAA. Outside of the dispute already covered, not a whole lot going on. The shows in Tuscan and Phoenix on October 19th and October 20th respectively weren't successful. Antonio Pena at the last minute pulled La Parca, Tinieblas Jr., Cibernetico, Blue Demon Jr., La Sirenita, Lost Destructors and Killer from the card and actually booked Rey Mysterio Jr. and Psychosis elsewhere as well but they did the American bookings, instead. The Tuscan show drew only 200 fans while Phoenix drew 2000 with Mil Mascaras vs. KGB and Conan and Mysterio Jr. vs. Psychosis and Juventud Guerrero as the double main event. The Phoenix show didn't draw a lot of Lucha Libre fans as it was a free grandstand show as part of the fair and the fans that came for the most part didn't know who the wrestlers were nor react to their flying moves nor their table breaking. It's really weird since AAA drew 1,700 a few months back in Phoenix for a regular show and the crowd was totally into everything. All Japan In another break in All Japan's formerly isolationist policy, Yoshiaki Fujiwara and Don Arakawa will work the November 28th and November 29th shows in Sapporo. The major cards of the Tag Team Tournament Series where each team faces each team twice will be November 16th at Karakuen Hall with Mitsuharu Misawa and Jun Akiyama vs. Steve Williams and Johnny Ace, Toshiaki Kaoda and Akira Tao vs. Giant Kimala 2 and Jun Izumida and Kenna Kowashi and the Patriot vs. Stan Hansen and Takao Amori. November 17th at Karakuen Hall has Kaoda and Tao vs. Kobashi and Patriot, Misawa and Akiyama vs. Kimala and Izumida and Hansen and Amori vs. Williams and Ace. November 21st in Hakata has Misawa and Akiyama vs. Kaoda and Tao, Kobashi and Patriot vs. Sabu and Gary Albright and Williams, and Ace vs. Kimala and Izumida. November 24th in Kyoto has Misawa and Akiyama vs. Hansen and Amori, Kobashi and Patriot vs. Williams and Ace, Kawada and Tao vs. Sabu and Albright. November 28th in Sapporo has Misawa and Akiyama vs. Kobashi and Patriot, Kawada and Tao vs. Williams and Ace and Albright and Sabu vs. Kimala and Izumida. November 29th in Sapporo has Misawa and Akiyama vs. Kawada and Tao, Kobashi and Patriot vs. Sabu and Albright, Hansen and Amori vs. Kimala and Izumida. December 2nd in Osaka has Kawada and Tao vs. Kobashi and Patriot. Misawa and Akiyama vs. Albright and Sabu and Williams and Ace vs. Hansen and Amori and the final night of the round robin on December 4th in Niigata has Kobashi and Patriot vs. Williams and Ace, Misawa and Akiyama vs. Kimala and Izumida and Kaoda and Tao vs. Albright and Sabu. The top two point getters meet for the championship on December 6th at Budokan Hall. Only the final 20 plus minutes of the Kaoda Kobashi 60 minute straw from Budokan aired on television on October 27th. The Hiragana Times, a bilingual Japanese-slash-English magazine in its September issue had a story written by Dory Funk about his earliest big matches in Japan as world champion against Giant Baba and Antonio Inoki. September 29th TV show did a poor 0.9 rating while October 6th did a tremendous 4.6. New Japan The tag team tournament has started to fall apart as Shiro Koshinaka blew out his knee on October 22nd in a tag match where he and Tatsumi Fujinami beat Rick Steiner and Keiji Muto, while Steve Regal returned home because his pregnant wife was suddenly taken ill. Koshinaka had surgery and will be out of action for about three months. Prelim wrestler Tatsuhito Takaiwa injured his elbow and needed surgery and will be out of action for two months. Takaiwa was scheduled to go to Mexico in November so that's been put on hold. In the key tournament matches this past week, October 21st in Beppu had Kazuo Yamazaki and Takashi Izuka over Steiner and Muto when Yamazaki pinched Steiner and Masahiro Chono and Hiroyoshi Tenzan over Riki Chashu and Kensuke Sasaki when Chono used the STF on Chashu. October 22nd in Kumamoto saw Fujinami and Koshinaka over Steiner and Muto. October 24th in Sasebo saw Satoshi Kojima and Manabu Nakanishi over Izuka and Yamazaki. October 25th in Miyazaki saw Steiner and Muto over Kojima and Nakanishi and Scott Norton and Shinya Hashimoto over Chono and Tenzan. October 26th in Kurume saw Chashu and Sasaki go to a 30 minutes draw with Yamazaki and Izuka. October 28th in Kagoshima had Muto and Steiner over Chono and Tenzan. 
as of October 28, of those still in contention, Steiner and Muto were in first place with five points, Hashimoto and Norton, Chashu and Sasaki and Yamazaki and Izuka have four, Chono and Tenzan, Nakanishi and Kojima have three so you can see it's booked close. With Regal and Koshinaka's teams both out, it screws up the previously planned booking similar to how G1 was screwed up when Junji Hirata was injured. Top two-point getters meet in the championship match on November 1st in Hiroshima. October 12th TV did a 2.8 rating. Other Japan notes. The 24-hour Samurai Cable Channel, which would air pro wrestling and other related martial arts type events, which was scheduled to debut in September, is now scheduled to start on December 1st. For its first night on the air, Antonio Inoki is supposed to produce a live primetime event on December 1st at Yoyogi Gym in Tokyo which would be a combination UFC and pro wrestling with independence, since the New Japan wrestlers are all under contract to TV Asahi and can't wrestle on another network. Dan Severn's opponent on the November 17th U Japan show will be Amari Bitetti of Brazil, who is the 1996 BJJ world champion that Don Fry massacred at the Detroit UFC. Rings had the first show of its annual Battle Dimension tournament on October 25th in Nagoya drawing, a disappointing crowd of 4,995 to see the return of Akira Maeda after being out for several months with knee surgery. Maeda, in a non-tournament match, beat Andre Kopolev in 4.59 with an arm lock. Reports are that he didn't look impressive, and considering the size of the crowd, people weren't dying to see him return either. Since Maeda left and the younger wrestlers became the focal point, Rings has changed and Maeda, the creator, would now look almost out of place in the ring as opposed to being in a commissioner-slash-promoter role, even though he's obviously got more name value than all of them. On November 22nd in Osaka, Maeda will headline against Yoshiaki Fujiwara. In some of the tourney matches on October 25th, Tsuyoshi Kosaka beat Dick Frey, Kiyoshi Tamura beat Alukai Mikhail, Mitsuya Nagai over Willie Peters, Bitsay Teriel beat Nikolai Zuev, Fulkan beat Masayuki Naruse and Yoshihisa Yamamoto beat 1992 Olympic judo gold medalist. 209 pounds, David Kaharshivali, so add that name to the list of Olympians that have done pro wrestling. He'd done some matches in the past as well, but we forgot him when we put together the article. Second round has Yamamoto vs. Gokaitsa, Nagai vs. Tamura, Han vs. Kosaka and Teriel vs. Hans Nyman. More legal problems. Hiramichi Fuyuki, Ghetto and Jado all quit war after the October 28th Karaku and Hall show. It was well known for months that Fuyuki would be leaving when his contract expired on December 7. War President Takei had a meeting with Fuyuki on October 25th where he, Ghetto and Jado said they would work October 28th and be finished, even though they were booked and advertised through the end of this current tour on November 2nd. Ghetto and Jado are under contract for a longer period of time and Takei said if they appear for another promotion, he'd file a legal action against them. On his final night with the group, Fuyuki did a clean job for Genichiro Tenryu so the six-man tag titles changed hands with Tenryu and Ultimo Dragon and Nobutaka Araya beating Fuyuki and Bam Bam Bigelow and Yoji Anjo. In Ghetto and Jado's final match, they lost to Big Japan's Shoji Nakamaki and President Shinya Kojika. Svetlana Gundarenko, the 317-pound Russian woman who won the L1 Women's UFC tournament in 1995 is booked on November 13th at Karakuen Hall for an LLPW show at Karakuen Hall against Shinobu Kondori, who she beat in the championship match. The match in 1995 was a shoot and was promoted by a pro wrestling company. No word what this match will be. The match is in jeopardy since on October 27th at Karakuen Hall, Kondori broke her nose in a pro wrestling match. Kondorenko placed fifth at the Atlanta Olympics this year. Eagle Sawai captured the LLPW title from Karula, Harley Saito, on the October 27th Karaku and Hall show. Final Iwa card was October 26th in Kameda. After the show, they announced they would be suspending operations but were planning on restarting the company in February with 22-year-old wrestler Keisuke Yamada as company president. Atsushi Onita appeared at the FMW show on October 26th at Karaku and Hall doing a backstage angle with Mr. Pogo. Pogo asked Onita to be his tag team partner and Onita slapped him in the face and said he's retired from wrestling. Pogo returns on November 6th to the ring from the neck injuries suffered on August 1st in the match with Terry Funk. On the October 26th show, Wing Kanemura retained his independent world title beating Hisakatsu Oya in the main event. Ryu Mago's Samurai Project promotion runs November 27th to December 2nd with Tiger Jeet Singh, Jesse Barr and the Crow as foreigners. USWA the return to Monday nights on October 21st didn't help the crowd as they drew another 375 fans and $1,800 to the flea market in Memphis. 
Brian Christopher and Wolfie D won the held-up USWA tag titles from Bill and Jamie Dundee in a match with Jimmy Valiant as referee, and after the match the Dundees beat up Valiant. With the move to Mondays that's the end of the 200-year era with Jerry Lawler as the consistent Memphis headliner and top singles champion since the Raw voiceovers are now done live on Monday nights and he won't be available. Lawler is still announcing the television on Saturday mornings with Dave Brown and Corey Macklin. The October 28th show saw the crowd increase to an estimated 800, largely due to the appearance of Sid Vicious teaming with Johnny Rotten to lose to the Dundees. On that show Macho Warrior Rick Hogan, doing a gimmick where he combines the interviews and mannerisms of the four, managed by Randy Hales, beat Christopher to win the USWA title when Hales hit Christopher with a briefcase. Christopher and Wolfie did an interview where they made up and were proud to be each other's partners. Now that this group has gotten back television in Evansville, Indiana, there's talk about making it a regular stop on the tour again. Lawler is doing the booking at least at present, not Randy Hales, as Hales isn't into comedy and at this point it's all a comedy show. Hales this week said that since he made PG-13, he was going to make more superstars and introduced a tag team called the Devil Dogs, two masked wrestlers. So in their squash match, the dogs got pounded on by the jobbers for seven minutes until Hales finally pulled them out of the ring, where they lost by count out, saying that since they have title matches upcoming, they can't waste their time in matches like this and said what the fans saw in the match was all part of their strategy they ended up losing the tag title match. He later introduced Hogan, who was said to be really funny and really bad. His interviews are a combination of Hogan and Savage and in the ring he does the mannerisms of the four wrestlers. Hales later did an interview where he went nuts a la Bob Backlund and said that his only real friend in wrestling is Lawler and got so upset he began frantically pulling his clothes off. Johnny Rodden did an interview saying that his brother Sid Vicious was on the road with WWF that day, so the Dundees beat him up to set up the tag. Mike Sample said he had something that would neutralize Sean Venom Snake, and brought out a dog he called Hercules, who it turned out was totally tame and tiny and said it was a snake-eating dog and then tried unsuccessfully to get the dog to act mean. Corey Macklin said he thought the dog would be a light snack for Venom Snake and the arena match ended up going 19 seconds. October 28th other top matches had Stephen Dunn beat Brickhouse Brown to earn a USWA title match and Valiant beat Jamie Dundee via DQ in less than one minutes when Bill interfered. Bart Sawyer is returning back to Oregon. ECW. Lineup for the November to remember on November 16th, which is the biggest show of the year, will be Tommy Dreamer and Terry Funk vs. Shane Douglas and Brian Lee, Sandman vs. Raven for the ECW title, Sabu and Rob Van Dam vs. Eliminators with the winners getting a tag title shot at Gangsta's later in the show, Mikey Whipwreck vs. Chris Candito, Louis Piccoli vs. Two Cold Scorpio and Axel Rotten vs. Hack Myers, the October 26th show at the ECW Arena before a sellout estimated at 1,350 fans was said to have been a hot show. It opened with Myers and Bubba Ray Dudley and Davey Morton, David Cash aka Dave Jericho, a protege of Ricky Morton, beating J.T. Smith and Axel Rotten and Devon Dudley when Spicoli did a run-in and gave Smith the Death Valley bomb. Whipwreck pinned Johnny Smith in a good match. They did an interview with Olympic gold medalist Kurt Angle who did commentary on the match with Taz beating Little Guido. Taz said that Angle was the best amateur wrestler in the world but that he was going to show him the difference between the best amateur wrestler and the best professional wrestler. He then showed him a tape of Kenta Kobashi. Just kidding. Kendito debuted pinning Spike Dudley in a very good match. Kendito was over huge, although he several times pointed to the stage area where Sonny was and there were huge chants of Sonny and Tammy along with chants of Skip is dead. After the match Candito kissed the ring and did a promo running down the WWF and talking about being there when ECW was first formed doing a babyface promo, and said he's helped rebuild ECW because it's the shits now, turning heel at the end of his promo. Shane Douglas kept the TV title beating Cody Michaels from Pittsburgh in a match where Pitbull No. 2 kept trying to hit the ring and was held back. Sandman kept the ECW title pinning Scorpio after Scorpio missed a move off the top rope. After the match, Sandman's son Tyler hit the ring dressed like Sandman and started hugging his father. Raven hit the ring along with Stevie Richards, Blue Meanie, Supernova and Laurie Fullington and destroyed Sandman including caning him in the eye busting his eye open, and finally Raven pulled out a cross from under the ring and tied Sandman to the cross and put barbed wire around his head and crucified him. Apparently this angle was even too extreme for ECW, because after intermission, Raven came in the ring out of character saying he was Scott Levy apologizing to anyone he may have offended for what happened. From what we're told, Angle, backstage, was really upset about the angle thinking it might ruin his image and feeling double-crossed about being there, and there were some fans who freaked out about it.
it's doubtful he'll be back. After intermission, Eliminators beat Steve Williams and Terry Gordy in a disappointing match. Saturn Power bombed Williams on the floor early so much of the match was them destroying Gordy, who looked really bad. The finish was incredible with Saturn doing an elbow drop off the scaffold onto Gordy for the pin, and both Saturn and Gordy went out on stretchers. Dreamer beat Lee in the scaffold match, in which before going on the scaffold for four minutes on top, they brawled all over the building with Dreamer a bloody mess. They piled four tables up on top of each other so when Lee took the bump backwards, it was only a few feet down, breaking the first table, but the other tables didn't break so he was shaken up a little from the fall. Paul Heyman said it was the best match this year at the ECW Arena although other reports said it ranged from fair to good. Finale saw Sabu and Rob Van Dam beat Dan Crawford and Doug Furness in a match said to have not been as good as their previous match, but still a very stiff match, when Sabu pinned Furness after Crawford hit his partner coming off the top rope. October 25th in Jim Fort, Pennsylvania before 432 fans was highlighted by another altercation involving fans. After the gangsters beat Eliminators in the main event, a police officer from a nearby town and New Jack got into it. Who started it depends on whose version one chooses to believe but New Jack hopped the guardrail after the guy and punches were exchanged and Saturn, Bubba Ray Dudley and maybe Taz ended up out there, and there was what was described as a riot lasting from 15 seconds to 3 minutes in which New Jack ended up collapsing and paramedics came. Although both ECW and WWF of late are doing angles with so-called fans getting beaten up by wrestlers, this definitely wasn't one of them. ECW starts on Y in Bridgeport, Connecticut on Fridays at 8 p.m. and on Network 1 Satellite on Fridays at midnight. The Douglas Pit Bull No. 1 angle from the show three weeks ago was one of the best angles of its type in years. Taz will be doing a gimmick where he refuses to wrestle until he gets a match with Sabu. Davey Morton will become a full-timer as Heyman was very impressed with him and is moving to Philadelphia. November 1st in Staten Island, New York at Sportsfest has Dreamer and Sandman vs. Raven and Lee in a cage. Sabu and Van Dam vs. Eliminators. Douglas vs. Spicoli for TV title. Williams vs. Scorpio. Pitbull No. 2 vs. Furnace. Todd Gordon vs. Bill Alfonso and more. November 2nd in Middletown, New York has Sandman vs. Scorpio for ECW title. Douglas vs. Dreamer for TV title, Gangsters vs. Eliminators for tag title, Sabu vs. Furnace, Pitbull No. 2 vs. Lee. Scorpio's final show will be November 16th before going with WWF full-time. Here and there. There was a Universal Valley Tudo event on October 22nd in Sao Paulo, Brazil before 3,000 fans. Dan Severn was scheduled against Pedro Otarvio in the main event, but Otarvio was injured so Severn instead fought Mario Neto. The match went the entire 30 minutes time limit and 10 minutes overtime, with Severn mainly dominating on the ground, but not being aggressive at all, and winning an easy decision. The overtime period was mainly dancing around until Severn took him down near the end. Next to time you hear a Brazilian complain about time limits and judges' decisions, just remember when they do the stuff in their own country. The matches have time limits and judges' decisions. There was also a tournament won by Kevin Randleman a two-time NCAA champion from Ohio State, who was Mark Coleman's training partner. Coleman was in Randleman's corner. The first round consisted of Americans, or in the case of Dave Benito, a Canadian, against Brazilians and the Brazilians lost to every match. Pro wrestler Geza Coleman Jr. won his first match making his Brazilian foe tap out from punches from the top, but tapped out at 10 minutes to Randleman when Randleman was pounding him with punches from the mount. In the EFC show Igor Zinoviev went into the match with John LeBay with a shoulder injury, but his shoulder was separated early in the match from the landing from the Northern Lights suplex, which explains why he was so thrilled to hang on for the draw as he fought almost the entire match with a separated shoulder. On the AWF television show that aired the weekend of October 19th, Bob Orton beat Tito Santana to win the title due to outside help from Mr. Fuji and Sheik Adnan Elkasi. Caught the show this weekend. It reminded me of watching the recent Brady Bunch movies. It's a bunch of guys in a style of wrestling that was in vogue about 15 years ago, transported through a time machine to the present where it looks so silly and out of place that it becomes campy. The wrestlers themselves are doing the exact same things they did when they were 15 years younger, but look 15 years older. Mick Karch does a total 1970s pro wrestling announcer gimmick with all the ancient cliches. It was hilarious with Karch trying to get over a bulbous Coco Ware and her early 40s Tony Atlas who moves like his feet are in cement blocks as a young speedy tag team challenging Greg Valentine and luscious Tommy Rich whose physique at middle age is beginning to resemble Buddy Rose. The TV itself is very well produced, basically a copy of mid-80s WWF production. Naturally the money mark Paul Alperstein, who funds the group, 
is pushed as the babyface president incessantly. Definitely good for a few laughs at 2 a.m. on Saturdays. Billy Graham had to cancel his religious drama based on his wrestling career scheduled for this week in Ontario, California because of his recent hip surgery. A correction. The late Neil Superior never worked as a WCW jobber. Another correction, Championship Wrestling Federation show listed last week for November 16th in Warren, Massachusetts is actually Warren, Michigan. European Wrestling Association presents Ultra Chaos 96 in London, England on December 14th at Walthamstow Assembly Hall with Mikey Whipwreck vs. Dirt by Kid for the junior heavyweight title that Kid lost to Whipwreck in ECW. The winner of that match faces Sabu for the title on the same show. The Pittsburgh Post-Gazette ran a story on October 27th about former wrestler Johnny DeFazio. Basic idea of the article was that he turned down what would have been a promising career as a wrestler to head his local steelworkers union, and how in the 80s, U.S. Steel wilted and pro wrestling flourished. Public Enemy is scheduled to wrestle Billy Joe Eaton and Barfly Mike on November 2nd in West Allis, Wisconsin, but with the recent surgeries to each, I don't know if that's possible. Among the wrestlers who worked over the weekend at the Compton, California and Los Angeles All Nation Center Lucha shows were Minis Mascarita Sagrada, Octagon Cheeto, Jurito Estrada, and Piratita Morgan, along with Pirata Morgan. WCW Nitro on October 28th from Phoenix drew about 6,300, 3,165 paying $34,771 for a very strong show. The wrestlers pretty much all had their working shoes on as with the exception of a non-match with the amazing French Canadians vs. High Voltage, which ended when Nasty Boys attacked Voltage, and the Lex Luger vs. Booker T match, all the matches had a good work rate. Steve Regal returned keeping the TV title beating Juventud Guerrera in a good short match although the people running around with NWO banners distracted the crowd from the match. Diamond Dallas Page pinned Mike Enos in a good match although Hall and Nash came out to divert attention and they teased that Page would be joining the NWO. Dean Malenko pinned Jim Powers in a match where Malenko looked great. They continued the Teddy Long slash Nick Patrick storyline as Patrick missed when Powers had Malenko pinned as he was arguing with Long. Psychosis came out to scout Malenko. Jeff Jarrett beat Ricky Morton with a figure four. Morton is really getting fat but these two worked a good match. Rey Mysterio Jr. beat Jimmy Graffiti in a tremendous short match. Chris Benoit beat Eddie Guerrero when Steve McMichael hit Guerrero with the briefcase. The idea they were selling is that both were injured from the previous night, Guerrero's rib injury was legit while Benoit's injury was a work. It was a good match given the theme they were both hurt and in pain, but not a good match in their typical style. Booker T beat Luger by count out when Sting was in the audience and Luger saw him and went out to talk with him but Sting left and Luger was counted out. They showed the Hogan-Piper segment from the previous night and Hogan closed the show with an interview saying how Piper was scared of him and had begged off. AC Green of the Phoenix Suns was wearing an NWO shirt but yelling at Patrick for being a heel ref, please make some sense out of that logic. A local TV station was doing a segment on Green being a pro wrestling fan which is why he was acting so vociferous. October 22nd in Rochester, Minnesota was the Saturday night tapings which drew a $16,000 house. Nothing major happened other than they taped a match with Ron Studd beating Roadblock. Gene Okerlund was scheduled to return at the October 28th Nitro, but the two sides still haven't reached a contract agreement. I believe the deal with Okerlund is he's been offered around $180,000 to work five dates per month, one pay-per-view and four Nitros, and would have no office or hotline duties. Bischoff teased that the NWO now wants part of Nitro rather than the Saturday night show. Glacier will be back in a few weeks. They want to change his routine a little and also have ordered more multicolored lights for his ring entrances. It appears Craig Pittman is going to end up going heel. October 24th in Stockton, California drew a sellout of about $2,500 paid and $32,000. The crowd was really hot, mainly a rural biker type crowd which made it a good atmosphere. I was told the NWO was more over at this show than any show to date, but really everyone was over. The show was marred by an incredible amount of no-shows. There were the no-shows due to injuries Ric Flair, Super Kaloa and Scott Steiner, due to being in Japan Rick Steiner, due to who the hell knows what sting, due to being booked elsewhere for personal appearances Diamond Dallas Page, and a whole slew who didn't make it because the San Francisco airport was delaying planes landing for a few hours, such as Randy Savage, who had an early flight but changed it to a later flight so he could negotiate with Eric Bischoff in Las Vegas and do personal appearances that day, Rey Mysterio Jr., Eddie Guerrero, Dean Malenko, Psychosis, and Juventud Guerrera or 12 no-shows in all with no announcement made to the crowd at any point. It could be forgiven not doing so at the beginning of the show since nobody knew who was going to arrive and almost nobody was there when the card started. Medusa beat Leilani Kai in a solid match with a lot of heat. 
Lex Luger beat Big Bubba, he dropped him twice trying the rack finisher before getting him the third time, in a long match with heat but no wrestling. Six pin Chavo Guerrero Jr. in the best match on the card. Hall and Nash beat Anderson and Benoit in a match where the crowd booed the hell out of Anderson and Benoit, who worked Total Hill style and Hall and Nash worked babyface style with Hall getting doubled on almost the entire way, and the fans chanting Razor, Razor. American Males beat Conan and Kevin Sullivan by a DQ when Conan hit Riggs with an object and Sullivan got the pin, but the ref saw the object and reversed things. Because of the heat, the show was decent even with all the no-shows, but the main event killed it. Savage no-showed, so Luger came out to work against Giant, and it only went 3.59 before Hall and Nash hit the ring, but Luger ducked out and was never touched and it was a DQ, so it was a negative star match. They postponed Flair's surgery until October 30th as they wanted him at the pay-per-view and after surgery, the doctors don't want him moving his arm for several weeks. October 25th in San Jose, California drew $2,231 and $34,865 for a show where most of the good wrestlers showed up, but the crowd came really only to see Nash and Hall so it really didn't get into the undercard that much. This card had a lot of messages, not all of them good, about the current direction. Hall and Nash were so over that nobody cared about anyone else, and while NWO is over, WCW wasn't in the least, nor were any WCW wrestlers. Even more surprising is that while the crowd was pro-NWO, it was a much smaller crowd than one would expect. The NWO fans come because they like their guys. The WCW fans don't come because their side always loses. The Mexican fans don't come because their favorites turn out to be prelim boys. So overall, the crowd is much smaller than anticipated. There were no Mexicans at all in the crowd despite using all the Mexicans on the show. If the idea of bringing the Mexicans in was to solidify that demo in the WCW camp, is failed miserably. When the Mexicans came in on their own they drew nearly triple the gate and double the crowd in the same building, and this time, with all the halls and gnashes and flares not there but advertised as being there added to the mix, none of the Mexican fans came. I'd say the message is twofold. First, Mexican fans want to see Mexican heroes, not people they thought were stars in preliminary matches in the big time only to show that they really aren't the stars worldwide that they thought they were. It's pretty clear as well as since the AAA wrestlers started appearing, and being presented as prelim wrestlers, in WCW they've had no drawing power on AAA shows in the US anymore despite having tons more exposure. If you look at promotions with huge ethnic draws in the past, it's because the ethnic stars were on top and rarely did jobs. Ethnic draws don't work when they're in prelims and they are stars to the people portrayed as jobbers. When Conan and Mysterio Jr. can work in San Jose and draw no Mexicans, it really says something about how poorly they've been utilized if the idea of using them was to draw Mexican fans. If the idea is just to have some talented guys working prelims, then none of this is of any significance. Second, it appears Mexican fans have no interest at all in American wrestling, or at least this version of American wrestling. In the past they've turned out to WWF shows in the area even when WWF had no Mexican wrestlers on the show, so in other words, how they're using these guys is a major turnoff to that group. Anderson and Benoit beat Conan and Sullivan via DQ in a good opener with the same finish as in the Conan-Sullivan match the night before. Actually Benoit got a very strong crowd reaction, particularly brawling with Sullivan all over the building. It was advertised as Conan and Sullivan vs. Males and Four Horsemen vs. Outsiders but flip-flopped for absolutely no reason and with no announcement to the crowd that couldn't understand it. Behind me there was a father whose son was asking him if a certain wrestler, I think it was Savage but could be wrong, was going to be there since his name was on the lineup sheet and the father said something to the effect of, he's a big star, so they only come to the arenas when they feel like it. Guerrero pinned Psicosis in a disappointing match since Guerrero missed a few spots and the crowd was totally not into them. When they did hot moves and kicked out of near falls the fans booed because they wanted it to be the finish, that's how bad the match got over live but the two worked basically a non-stop good match. It was way toned down compared to what you'd see of these guys in Mexico. As they learn to work American style to impress their bosses, which they don't fully know, they're less impressive to the crowd than when they do what they are masters of. Six pin Chavo Guerrero Jr. Nash watched a few seconds of the match which killed the crowd's interest in the match. He realized it and left, but the damage was done. Six even had to get on the mic to tell the crowd the match was going on in the ring. This was a crowd that came to see two celebrities in their eyes Hall and Nash, and nobody else. Medusa pinned Kai in a match where the crowd didn't care about it but it was watchable. Mysterio Jr. pinned Malenko in a great match. It was basically the exact same match as in Las Vegas minus the dives and with a different finish. 
both were cheered equally as it seemed both were so good the crowd respected their performance. Eddie Guerrero pinned Damian, making his WCW debut. It was a solid match but the crowd didn't know or care about Damian. Luger beat Bubba with a schoolboy. After the fiasco on Monday and Thursday, Luger didn't even try the rack. Hall and Nash beat Males in a so-so match with Hall and Nash working all the face spots and being over like crazy. Males had Ray Hollett zap from American Gladiators, in their corner although she never played a part in the match. Finish saw them drag the corpse of Savage to the ring for a match with Giant that was negative several stars. Giant threw him around for a few minutes until Savage blocked a choke slam, did a body slam and Hall, Ash and Six hit the ring for the DQ but Savage bailed before he got touched. However, Six did the ring announcing and said the NWO reversed the decision because Savage used a foreign object and they posed in the ring afterwards. Plan right now is to do a Nitro from San Jose State the day after the Super Brawl at the Cow Palace in February. There were wrestlers who were fans growing up that had never worked the Cow Palace and know of its history. In the 60s, the Cow Palace ranked right there with Madison Square Garden as the top wrestling building in the country, that were excited about working a big show in that arena. They had a Crockett tombstone at Havoc. Max Payne was backstage at Havoc saying he's given up wrestling and gone into a career playing the guitar. Entertainment Tonight was in Las Vegas doing a feature on Hogan as a bad guy. Nitro on November 4th in Grand Rapids, Michigan was set up for about 5,000 in a 12,000-seat building and was already sold out as of the weekend, so tickets weren't available on Monday until they decided to open up the second deck. They are expecting a $100,000 house for the show. Psicosis and Juventud Guerrero as a tag team will be replacing Public Enemy at the spot shows against Nasty Boys. Grunge got his knee scoped this past week, while Rocco Rock's elbow surgery was scheduled for October 30th. They are doing a tournament to crown a WCW Women's Champion, three guesses who dominates that title, which will include matches starting at the November 4th Nitro. In the tourney include Medusa, Chigusa Nagio, Bull Nakano, Kira Hokuto, Leilani Kai, Malia Hasaka, and Kaoru. Ratings for the weekend of October 26th saw main event at 1.4, Saturday night at 2.1, going against the conclusion of the World Series, and Pro at 1.6. The 8 p.m. Eastern start of the Havoc pay-per-view was because it was in Las Vegas and not something that will be a regular thing. Exact house numbers for last weekend were October 18th in Minneapolis 7,473 and $100,400, October 19th in La Crosse, WI1, 990 and $24,250 and October 20th in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 2716 and $36,034. WWF. Brian Pillman had ankle surgery on October 23rd in Cincinnati once again. They did an angle the night before which aired on Superstars where Steve Austin destroyed his ankle because he thought Pillman was putting over Bret Hart, then blocked the ambulance from taking him to the hospital with his car. On Raw, Austin threatened everyone in sight as he was in studio to do a face-to-face -face with Hart. He threw down a stage hand, threatened the makeup girl, until the police arrived but Austin told the police they couldn't do anything to him because Vince McMahon wouldn't let anything happen to him because of all the money he was going to make McMahon. Austin is working really hard to get his character over and it seems to have broken him out of the pack into a genuine headliner. Pillman's ankle didn't heal properly from the previous surgery, so they had to re-break the ankle and start the healing process from scratch. It'll be at least six months before he'll be able to wrestle again if it heals properly this time. They started doing televised features on Dwayne Johnson, who will go as Rocky Maivia to honor his father and grandfather and showed tape of both of them in the WWF. Funny to see how short Peter Maivia was compared to the wrestlers of today since in his day he was a Samoan monster. They taped a segment on October 26th at the Cauliflower Alley Banquet with Dwayne and Rocky Johnson where the father was awarded. Highlight of that banquet was Dory Funk and Jack Briscoe doing their final angle. Briscoe, 55, who has been a recluse in recent years, showed up in great shape. Funk presented Jack and Gerald with an award and mentioned that he'd wrestled Jack at least 300 times and gave him a Dory Funk t-shirt. The Briscoes ripped it up. Dory went after Jack and had to be held back by Dan Severn. They referred to the Briscoes on TV as former WWF Tag Team Champions, which they never were although that was about the only regional title Briscoe didn't win in a territory he regularly worked. Road Agent Chief Jay Strongbow, Joe Scarpa, suffered what was first feared to have been a heart attack at the October 21st Raw tapings in Fort Wayne, Indiana as he slumped over while sitting in a chair. He was hospitalized but it was an 80% blockage of an artery that was cleared up and he was released from the hospital on October 25th. Ahim Albrecht should be in the ring within the next few weeks, doing house shows with Salvatore Sincere. The two are going to work out their match in the gym. 
I'm told Albrecht has a tremendous attitude when it comes to wanting to learn, which is the exact opposite of Mark Henry. A few weeks back, Albrecht blew out his knee and needed his scoped and tore the peck of Chris Candito as they were working on high spots. Candito quit at the TV tapings because they didn't have his role for him and wanted him to stay on to teach Albrecht, Henry and Johnson and he felt that at 24, it was too young for him to be out of the ring and teaching new talent, so he quit to go to ECW and probably All Japan in 1997. The original idea was for Candito to do an Eddie Gilbert type gimmick as a tag team partner with Barry Buchanan, SMW Punisher, but the idea was dropped. Candito apparently is also leaving overheat with Shawn Michaels, who apparently would get upset at him using hot moves and prelim matches on the house shows, moves which he thought were apparently his domain. Since Sonny has a lengthy big money contract, she's staying, although she won't be going on the road tours and her job will mainly be public appearances, working TV nights and doing the Saturday morning live wire. She's toned down the airhead bimbo part of her original role on the live wire and is doing a role more like her real self over the past two weeks. Barry Windham and Vader both suffered broken foots. Wyndham broke his foot at television. Vader broke his foot in the Boy Meets World taping match in Anaheim on October 13th against Jake Roberts. He worked the pay-per-view match with Sid on the broken foot, but then missed TV and the house shows, which he was scheduled to work main events against Shawn Michaels on, until returning on October 25th in Chicago. The original plan was for Vader to beat Sid at the Buried Alive show and to beat Michaels for the title at Survivor Series. The plan was changed, but I don't believe the broken foot had anything to do with the change in plans. Perhaps Hart coming back and the idea that they'll spend from now until Mania building for Hart Michaels and not muddy the waters by switching the title earlier? Perhaps something else. Vader and Farouk, who was supposed to win the IC title and is out of action until November 17th with a badly torn groin, were both told they had to switch the original plans and not give them the belts because J.J. Dillon was at the meetings where those long-term plans were made, and since he worked for the opposition. They had to change all the storylines he knew. If that's the real reason for the changes, which I doubt, it's the silliest thing I've ever heard. If the plans make sense and will draw, the fact WCW knows of them, even if they try and get the word out, isn't going to make the slightest difference in them drawing. If they don't make sense and won't draw, they could be the greatest guarded secret in the history of mankind, but they still won't draw. Titan must have been extremely confident Bret Hart was coming because the box sleeve for the Survivor Series video lists Michaels vs. Vader, the original plan, and Hart vs. Austin is the top two matches. Savio Vega's injury was a torn calf muscle that he got in the gym. They expect Ahmed Johnson back for the December pay-per-view show. In the storyline, Mr. Perfect's wrestling license was revoked, since he had no intention of wrestling anyway since he's making so much on disability insurance, but he'll be going on the road as Hunter Hearst Helmsley's manager. On the live wire show a few weeks back when Johnson was on, a caller who said he was black, asked about racism in the WWF and Johnson said there wasn't any. It was actually a setup call as the caller was Kevin Dunn, a white producer of the show. Weekend ratings for October 26th were blast off at 0.7, Livewire at 1.3 and Superstars at 1.7. Besides the Austin Pillman angle, also at Superstars on October 22nd in Cincinnati which drew 3,137 paying $48,773, other guns wrestle the rockers. Billy walked out on Bart, leaving him to face both men, but Bart won anyway. Mark Mero had two matches with Goldust. Mero won the first, but apparently the ref wasn't supposed to count to three, so they had to get back in the ring and redo the finish with the DVQ ending it was supposed to be and will air. Lance Wright is now the ring announcer at Superstars and also doing some ring announcing at the house shows. Two Cold Scorpio's role as a babyface pimp character is designed after the Huggy Bear character of the Starsky and Hutch television show from the 70s, Bart and Freddie Joe Floyd beat Billy and T.L. Hopper, and for the match Billy beat up Hopper and tried to make up with Bart, but then beat Bart up as well. Undertaker and Mero and Sid beat Goldust and Mankind and Austin. They did a tug of war with Henry vs. Crush. Henry was winning when Helmsley joined Crush, as did Goldust, but Henry was still winning and finally all three attacked Henry. Dark match main saw Michaels over Helmsley in 10 minutes of a dud match of nothing but stalling. Dark matches from the Indianapolis Buried Alive pay-per-view that we inadvertently left out of last week's issue were Godwins over Rockers in a one-star match, and Michaels keeping the title over Goldust in a two-and-one-quarter stars match. Al's shows this week were October 23rd in Evansville, Indiana drew $2,646 and $35,127, October 24th in Springfield, Illinois drew $2,480 and $33,657, 
October 25th in Chicago drew 7,979 and $149,753. October 26th in St. Louis drew 4,778 and $75,583. And October 27th in Cape Girardeau, Missouri drew 2,089 and $31,528. The Australia-Malaysia-Philippines tour scheduled for the end of November early December was cancelled and in its place they are running smaller cities in the Northeast. They still have two shows booked during that time frame in the United Kingdom. WrestleMania was announced as taking place at the Rosemont Horizon to the fans there at the October 25th house show. Crush has been doing an angle which was copied from ECW where he's beating up fans and security guards. Clarence Mason will be managing Farouk. Michaels and Smith had a hot match on Raw. The Reader's Pages Indies It really burns me up when I read a letter saying how much the US wrestling scene sucks. The truly annoying part about it is that fans blame the promoters, blame the wrestlers, etc. but fail to assign the blame to themselves. Think about it. Where is the young talent going to come from? The Independents. Check out the results pages sometimes. Many of them list attendances. The average attendance is about 100 fans for an independent show in my area. Do you honestly think a promoter can afford to pay his wrestlers what they're worth on a $700 gate? I see many letters in the Observer decrying the big two for the lack of talented workers, but where do you develop new talent? The independents. I've been wrestling for nearly eight years. You have no idea how hard it is to put my body through the physical abuse I do when there are 75 people in the building. It makes you feel very unappreciated. Most wrestlers can't cope with it and quit within their first year. The money situation doesn't help either. Truly dedicated martyrs, or morons, depending on your point of view I feel that I fit into both categories some days, will travel more than 100 miles to work for $25 to $50. That doesn't even cover food or gas in some cases. Some guys, myself included, will travel more than 3 hours each way on a Sunday, work a shot, and get home at 2 a.m. and then get up and go to work the next day. My suggestion to fans. Attend some independent shows. Admittedly, you're bound to see some slobs out there. But through trial and error, you can usually find a decent promotion running regularly in your area. If you see someone you think is good, tell the promoter. The chances are he'll keep booking the guy to keep you coming. In the independent world, every single fan counts. Tell the worker you like his work as well. Everyone at this level could stand a compliment now and again. If you and a group of friends like a guy's work, send letters to WWF or WCW. If they think there's a chance he could put a few dollars in their pockets, they may give him a tryout. Above all else, attend the matches. I work for Ringside Wrestling out of Nashua, New Hampshire. I guarantee you this. Come out and me and the boys will work our balls off for you. Scott Maverick Wild Day Prey. Ashburnham, Massachusetts. This is the end of this conversion. Be sure to comment and subscribe. See you next time.